Hi guys, this is Miss Cassie from Kids Alley. Um, as I said, we have started something new called Kids Alley Online, and this is just another part of it today. Um, we are going to be starting a book together that we're reading. Some of the times we might do like a larger storybook, but there's another book that we're going to read called The Wizard of Oz, which some of you have seen the movie, but I think less of you have probably read the book, that we're going to read in some pieces, one or two chapters a day or every couple of days. Um, Miss Kathy, if you can show them this board over here. So this book was really good to um, listen to or read individually. This is a good book to listen to or read as a family. If you are an older kid and you're kind of thinking, ah, I'm too old for this, I'd rather read it myself, well, it can be found right here. So this book is The Wonderful Wizard of Oz by L. Frank Baum. It can be found free and legally, that's the key here, at www.gutenberg.org slash ebooks slash 55, um, because this book is actually on the public domain. Um, so take a minute, find that. Um, when you come to that link, if you're interested in following along with this book, when you come to that link, there's going to be sort of a list of, of things that you could open. Open the first link on there and you will be able to access The Wizard of Oz. So we're going to begin. I would suggest that you find somewhere where you feel comfortable, where you're ready to just listen and let your imagination take you somewhere else. I have picked the library because I feel comfortable in the library. It is a happy place for me because I love books. Maybe your bedroom, maybe the living room if you're listening and watching this as a family. If you have followed the link that I just gave you, your version won't have pictures. My version here has some pictures some of the time but it doesn't have pictures like every page. So when there's a picture, I'm gonna make sure that I'm gonna hold up the book and I'm gonna show it to you guys so you get to see the cool stuff that I get to see. There's also gonna be points here where I'm going to pause and I might want to explain something, ask you to think about something, just because there are readers of different age ages, um, listeners of different ages here, that I might need to explain a couple words here and there because this book was written a long time ago and there are people at different reading levels. Uh, so here we go, The Wizard of Oz. So I'll let the camera show <laughs> this picture first. <laughs> awesome. The Wizard of Oz, as I said before, is by L. Frank Baum, um, and this is illustrated by Greg Hildebrand. So chapter one, the cyclone. Dorothy lived in the midst of the great Kansas prairies with Uncle Henry, who was a farmer, and Aunt Em, who was the farmer's wife. Their house was small, for the lumber to build it had to be carried by wagon many miles. There were four walls, a floor and a roof, which made one room. And this room contained a rusty looking cooking stove, a cupboard for the dishes, a table, three or four chairs, and the beds. Uncle Henry and Aunt Em had a big bed in one corner, and Dorothy a little bed in another corner. There was no garret at all and no cellar, except a small hole dug in the ground called a cyclone cellar, where the family could go in case one of those great whirlwinds arose mighty enough to crush any buildings in its path. It was reached by a trap door in the middle of the floor, from which a ladder led down into a small dark hole. Pause. A cyclone is like a tornado. If you've watched The Wizard of Oz, it's a form of weather, and it's wind that comes spiraling down, and usually it would hit the ground. So that's what we're talking about here. It's a cellar to help you avoid the tornado if it was to come so you could hide there with your family. I'm going to keep reading now. When Dorothy stood in the doorway and looked around, she could see nothing but the great gray prairie on every side. Not a tree nor a house broke the broad sweep of flat country that reached the edge of the sky in all directions. The sun had baked the plow land into a gray mass, with little cracks running through it. Even the grass was not green, for the sun had burned the tops of the long blades until they were the same color to be seen everywhere. Once the house had been painted, <clears throat> once the house had been painted, but the sun blistered the paint and the rains washed it away, and now the house was as dull and gray as everything else. When Aunt Em came to live there, she was a young, pretty wife. The sun and wind had changed her too. They had taken the sparkle from her eyes and left them a sober gray. They had taken the red from her cheeks and lips, and they were gray also. She was thin and gaunt and never smiled now. When Dorothy, who was an orphan, first came to her, 
Aunt M had been so startled by the child's laughter that she would scream and press her hand to her heart whenever Dorothy's merry voice reached her ears. And she still looked at the little girl with wonder that she could find anything to laugh at at all. Uncle Henry never laughed. He worked hard from morning till night and did not know what joy was. He was gray also from his long beard to his rough boots, and he looked stern and solemn and rarely spoke. It was Toto that made Dorothy laugh and saved her from growing as gray as her other surroundings. Toto was not gray. He was a little black dog with long silky hair and small black eyes that twinkled merrily on either side of his funny wee nose. Toto played all day long and Dorothy played with him and loved him dearly. Pause. I am lucky that I have my friend Toto here today. So while we read, we have Toto with us. And that makes me pretty excited that we get the thing that makes Dorothy's life better, we get in our lives too. So I'm gonna continue reading now. Today, however, they were not playing. Uncle Henry sat upon the doorstep and looked anxiously at the sky, which was even grayer than usual. Dorothy stood in the door with Toto in her arms and looked at the sky too. Aunt Em was washing the dishes. From the far north, they heard a low wail of the wind, and Uncle Henry and Dorothy could see where the long grass bowed in waves before the coming storm. There was now a sharp whistling in the air from the south as they turned their eyes that way and saw ripples in the grass coming from that direction also. Suddenly, Uncle Henry stood up. There's a cyclone coming, Em, he called to his wife. I'll go look after the stock. Then he ran towards the sheds where the cows and horses were kept. Aunt Em dropped her work and came to the door. One glance told her of the danger close at hand. So here's the picture for this part. You'll see he's looking outside to see that the cyclone is coming. Quick, Dorothy, she screamed. Run for the cellar. Toto jumped out of Dorothy's arms and hid under the bed, and the girl started to get him. Aunt Anne, badly frightened, threw open the trap door in the floor and climbed down the ladder into the small dark hole. Dorothy caught Toto at last and started to follow her aunt, but she was halfway across the room, and there came a great shriek from the wood, and the house shook so hard she lost her footing and sat down suddenly upon the floor. Then a strange thing happened. A house, the house whirled around two or three times and rose slowly through the air. Dorothy felt as if she were going up in a balloon. The north and south winds met where the house stood and made it the exact center of the cyclone. In the middle of a cyclone, the air is generally still, but the great pressure of the wind on every side of the house raised it higher and higher until it was at the very top of the cyclone. And there it remained, and it was carried miles and miles away as easily as you could carry a feather. It was very dark, and the wind howled terribly around her, but Dorothy found she was riding quite easily. After the first few whirls around, and one other time when the house tipped badly, she felt as if she were being rocked gently, like a baby in a cradle. Toto did not like it. He ran around the room, now here, now there, barking loudly, but Dorothy sat quite still on the floor and waited to see what would happen. Once Toto got too near to the trap door and he fell in, and at first the little girl thought she had lost him, but soon she saw one of his ears sticking up through the hole, for the strong pressure of the air was keeping him up so that he could not fall. She crept to the hole, caught Toto by the ear, and dragged him into the room again, afterward closing the trap door so that no more accidents could happen. Hour after hour passed, and slowly Dorothy got over her fright, but she felt quite lonely. So let's see, here's a picture. So you can see, look, the house is all the way up there in the cyclone. I'm going to read that sentence again. Hour after hour passed, and slowly Dorothy got over her fright, but she felt quite lonely, and the wind shrieked so loudly all about her that she nearly became deaf. At first, she had wondered if she would be dashed to pieces when the house fell again. But as the hours passed and nothing terrible happened, she stopped worrying and resolved to wait calmly and see what the future would bring. At last, she crawled over the swaying floor to her bed, and lay down upon it, and Toto followed and lay down beside her. In spite of the swaying of the house and the wailing of the wind, Dorothy soon closed her eyes and fell fast asleep. So that's one chapter, moving on to chapter two, the council with the munchkins. She was awakened by a shock so sudden and severe that if Dorothy had not been lying down on the soft bed, she might have been hurt. As it was, 
The jar made her catch her breath and wonder what had happened, and Toto put his cold little nose into her face and whined dismally. Dorothy sat up and noticed that the house was not moving, nor was it dark, for the bright sunshine came in at the window, flooding the little room. She sprang from her bed with Toto at her heels and ran to open the door. The little girl gave a cry of amazement and looked about her, her eyes growing bigger and bigger at the wonderful sight she saw. The cyclone had set the house down, very gently, for a cyclone, in the midst of a country of marvelous beauty. There were lovely patches of green sward all around, with stately trees bearing rich and luscious fruits. Banks of gorgeous flowers were on every hand, and birds with rare and brilliant plumage sang and fluttered in the trees and bushes. So guys, the plumage is kind of saying some really brightly, beautifully covered, colored feathers. So, so it's like a really interesting looking bird. A little way off was a small brook, rushing and sparkling along between green banks and murmuring in a, great, in a voice very grateful to a little girl who had lived so long on the dry gray prairies. While she stood looking eagerly at the strange and beautiful sights, she noticed coming toward her a group of the queerest people she had ever seen. They were not as big as the grown folk she had always been used to, but neither were they very small. In fact, they seemed about as tall as Dorothy, who was a well-grown child for her age, although they were, as far as looks go, many years older. Three were men and one a woman, and all were oddly dressed. They wore hats that rose to a small point a foot above their heads, with little bells around the brims that tinkled sweetly as they moved. The hats of the men were blue. The little woman's hat was white, and she wore a white gown that hung in plates from her shoulders, over it were sprinkled little stars that glistened in the sun like diamonds. The men were dressed in blue, of the same shade as their hats, and wore well-polished boots with a deep roll of blue at the tops. The men, Dorothy thought, were about as old as Uncle Henry, for two of them had beards. But the little woman was doubtless much older. Her face was covered with wrinkles, her hair was nearly white, and she walked rather stiffly. When these people drew near the house where Dorothy was standing in the doorway, they paused and whispered among themselves as if they were afraid to come farther. But the little old woman walked up to Dorothy, made a low bow, and said in a sweet voice, You are most welcome, most noble sorceress, to the land of the Munchkins. We are so grateful to you for having killed the wicked witch of the East and for setting our people free from bondage. Dorothy listened to this speech with wonder. What could the little woman possibly mean by calling her a sorceress and saying she had killed the wicked witch of the east? Dorothy was an innocent, harmless little girl who had been carried by a cyclone many miles from home, and she had never killed anything in her life. But the little woman evidently expected her to answer, so Dorothy said with hesitation, You are very kind, but there must be some mistake. I have not killed anything. Your house did anyway, replied the little old woman with a laugh, and that is the same thing. See, she continued, pointing to the corner of the house. There are her two toes sticking out from under a block of wood. Dorothy looked and gave a little cry of fright. There, indeed, just under the corner of the great beam of the house rested on were two feet sticking out, shod in silver shoes with pointed toes. Oh dear, oh dear, cried Dorothy, clasping her hands together in dismay. The house must have fallen on her. Whatever shall we do? There is nothing to be done, said the little woman calmly. But who was she? asked Dorothy. She was the wicked witch of the east, as I said, answered the little woman. She has held all the munchkins in bondage for many years, and making them slaves for her night and day. Now they are all set free and are grateful to you for the favor. Who are the munchkins? inquired Dorothy. They are the people who live in this land of the east where the wicked witch ruled. Are you a munchkin? asked Dorothy. No, but I am their friend, although I live in the land of the north. When they saw the witch of the east was dead, the munchkin sent a swift messenger to me, and I came at once. I am the witch of the north. Oh, gracious, cried Dorothy. Are you a real witch? Yes, indeed, answered the little woman, but I am a good witch, and the people love me. I am not as powerful as the wicked witch who is ruled here or <coughs> who was ruled here or I should have set the people free myself but I thought all witches were wicked said the girl who was half frightened at facing the real witch oh no that is a great mistake there are only four witches in all the land of Oz and two of them those who live in the north and south are good witches I know this is true for I am one of them myself and cannot be mistaken those who dwelt in the east and the west were indeed wicked witches 
But now that you have killed one of them, there is but one wicked witch in all the land of Oz, the one who lives in the West. But, said Dorothy, after a moment's thought, Aunt M has told me that all the witches are, are dead years and years ago. Who is Aunt M? inquired the old little woman. She is my aunt, who lives in Kansas, where I came from. The witch of the north seemed to think for a time, with her head bowed, bowed, and her eyes upon the ground. Then she looked up and said, I do not know where Kansas is, for I have never heard of that country mentioned before, but tell me, is it a civilized country? Oh yes, replied Dorothy. Then that accounts for it. In the civilized countries, I believe, there are no witches left, nor wizards, no sorceresses, <laughs> nor magicians. But, you see, the land of Oz has never been civilized for we are cut off from the rest of the world. Therefore, we still have witches and wizards amongst us. Who are the wizards? asked Dorothy. Oz himself is the great wizard, answered the witch, sinking her voice to a whisper. He is more powerful than all the rest of us together. He lives in the city of emeralds. Dorothy was going to ask another question. But just then the munchkins, who had been standing silently, gave a loud shout and pointed the, to the corner of the house where the wicked witch had been lying. What is that? asked the little old woman and looked and began to laugh. The feet of the dead witch had disappeared entirely and nothing was left but the silver shoes. She was so old, explained the witch of the north, that she dried up quickly in the sun. That is the end of her. But the silver shoes are yours and you shall wear them. She reached down and picked up the shoes. So we're going to pause there before I keep reading so we can see that scene. And I'll read that sentence again. Let's see. That is the end of her, but the silver shoes are yours, and you shall have them to wear. She reached down and picked up the shoes, and after shaking the dust out of them, handed them to Dorothy. The witch of the east was proud of these shoes said one of the munchkins, and there's some charm connected with them. But what it is, we never knew. Dorothy carried the shoes into the house and placed them on a table. Then she came out again to the munchkins and said, I am anxious to get back to my aunt and uncle, for I am sure they'll worry about me. Can you help me find my way? The munchkins and the witch first looked at one another, then at Dorothy, and then shook their heads. At the east, not far from here, said one, there's a great desert. A nun could live to cross it. It is the same at the south, said another, for I've been there and have seen it. The south is the country of the quadlings. I am told, said the third man, that it is the same at the west, and that country where the Winkies live is ruled by a wicked witch of the west who would make you her slave if you passed her way. The north is my home, said the old lady, and at its edge is the same great desert that surrounds this land of Oz. I'm afraid, my dear, you will have to live with us. Dorothy began to sob at this, for she felt lonely among all these strange people. Her tears seemed to grieve the kind-hearted munchkins, for they immediately took out their handkerchiefs and began to weep also. As for the little old woman, she took off her cap and bounced the point at the end of her nose, while she counted one, two, three in a solemn voice. At once, the cap changed to a slate on which was written in big white chalk marks, let Dorothy go to the city of emeralds. I'm gonna pause when it says slate, that's almost like a chalkboard. That's what that means. The little old woman took the slate from her nose and having read the words on it asked, is your name Dorothy, my dear? Yes, answered the child looking up and drying her tears. Then you must go to the city of emeralds. Perhaps Oz will help you. Where's the city? asked Dorothy. It is exactly in the center of the country and is ruled by Oz, the great wizard I told you of. Is he a good man? inquired the girl anxiously. He's a good wizard. Whether he is a man or not, I cannot tell, for I've never seen him. How can I get there? asked Dorothy. You must walk. It is a long journey through a country that is sometimes pleasant and sometimes dark and terrible. However, I will use all the magic arts I know of to keep you from harm. Won't you go with me, pleaded the girl, who began to look at the little old woman as her only friend. No, I cannot do that, she replied, but I will give you my kiss, and no one will dare injure a person who has been kissed by the Witch of the North. She came close to Dorothy and kissed her gently on the forehead, where her lips touched the girl they had left a round, shining mark, as Dorothy soon found out after. The road to the City of Emeralds is paved with yellow brick, said the witch, so you cannot miss it. 
When you get to Oz, do not be afraid of him, but tell him your story and ask him to help you. Goodbye, my dear. The three munchkins bowed low to her and wished her a pleasant journey, after which they walked away through the trees. The witch gave Dorothy a friendly little nod, whirled around on her left heel three times, and straight away disappeared, much to the surprise of little Toto, who barked after her loudly enough when she had gone, because he had been afraid to even growl while she stood by. But Dorothy, knowing her to be a witch, had expected her to disappear in just that way, and was not surprised in the least. That is the end of chapter two, guys. So I hope you have enjoyed reading time with me. I love reading. Um, this is a book that, the, this actual book my dad would read to my sisters and I growing up, and I hope that you guys get the same amount of joy from it as I did when I was a child. Um, we have other chapters coming soon. Join our Facebook group. You can share the video. You can comment if you have any questions about it, anything that you really liked in the story. Um, and that's it. We'll talk soon. Bye.